Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Voice Essentials. I hope you are well wherever you are on the planet, whether you are joining me on in on a Monday or whether you're joining me on a Sunday. Um, it's so good to be um, spending the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so together and um, yeah, we, we, this is our last Q&A that we'll be doing uh, for quite some time, as in, in fact it will be four weeks, five weeks, Linda corrected me, because it's the 9th of May that we'll be back. So next week is my studio break. The week after that is Easter Monday. We celebrate Easter here um, in Australia and our family does, and so there's a public holiday for Easter Monday. And then there is um, Anzac Day, which is a, uh, an important cultural holiday here in Australia. And uh, then the day after that is what's referred to as Labor <laughs> Labor Day, which is the 2nd of May. So anyway, all, literally this string of Mondays, which means that we won't be back together until the 9th of May. So put that in your calendars, hit the subscribe button because, and then the white bell icon because then you'll get the notifications to remind you of when we come back. So a little bit of a break for us, but we'll be coming back with the Q&A. Um, I've already got, you know, some really great guests lined up for the new term. And uh, wasn't, wasn't it great to have John Henney on the show last week? He, he was... He, he, you know, he really knows his stuff. And uh, I've, I found last week's show really educational for all of us in, in so much as we talked about acoustics and tonal development and resonance and all of these things. If you missed it, don't hesitate to jump across and watch it after tonight's show, today's show for you. And, uh, and a, a shout out to all of you who are watching this show perhaps as a replay because so many of you watch the show um, after we've been live and uh, so a big hello to you all if you if you've hit that um, replay button um, after the fact ah uh, let's see what else have we got oh here's some news so the dr dan singer's starting guide all of you know that i've had a new course in the works and it is alive baby it is live so if you have purchased the dr dan singer's starting guide um some of you got it at a super cheap price which i'm really happy that you did it is live you can jump in and you can start working your way through the content uh and i am really really looking forward to getting your feedback as to just the benefit that it builds into your into your voice. This course, the new course, is different to the other three courses, Voice Essentials 1, 2, and 3, because it's not focused on technical development. So it is, it's different. It's more of a content-driven um, ideology, you know, uh, knowledge, theory-based, but such important theory, pr very practical theory, that uh, that I just I absolutely know will benefit your vocal development. And so I want to I want to say to you, uh, if you've been thinking about grabbing it, then definitely do it. And uh, and I know that the information we go into vocal anatomy, you know, understanding the voice. I find that singers. The example that uh, that I that I've given before is I know a lot of really very very good instrumentalists, guitarists, drummers, keyboardists, and they they know every little bit about their instrument. Like I've I've known guitarists who can tell you the forest that the wood was felled in that makes their guitar, and in fact the really, really high-level artisan-crafted guitars don't just have one type of wood. They, they'll have multiple types, one type of wood for the neck, one type of wood for the front um, soundboard, another type for, for the, the edging. And, and the really, really um, highly skilled guitarists, they can tell you literally <laughs> what side 
of the the forest mountain that the wood was felled in. They get that into it. At the other end of the scale is often singers, singers who, you know, we, we know very little about our instrument. And yet there is no other instrument on the face of the planet that is so complex that requires a highly tuned understanding and knowledge about its bits and how it works and how we coordinate the musculature all to bring about high quality sound. So what I wanted to do with this new course was really give you access to what is more often than not reserved for university level information. You know, you kind of, most people find themselves going to university to learn the stuff that we cover in the course that I've designed in the Dr. Dan Singer's Starting Guide. And so I encourage you, if you want to really up your your knowledge uh, and empower your vocal development, then this, this is the course. So vocal anatomy, we look at voice care. You know, how do you look after it? You've only got one. You know, a guitarist, even if they've spent, you know, $17,000 on their guitar, that would be an amazing guitar, and if something went wrong with it, well, you know, money's just money. You can just go and buy another one. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be buying another $17,000. But anyway, you get my point, right? Your voice, you can't do that. Your voice, it is just what it is. And you've got to look after it. And so I really deep dive into that. And so uh, I, wa I want you to, to jump into that course. And I am really keen to get your feedback as to um, as to your experience and um, and to see how that's all going for you, and then of course you would move into um, the 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 technical uh, workshopping activities of Voice Essentials One, Voice Essentials Two, and Voice Essentials Three, and something that I don't know I made a big big point of um, in the release of Dr. Dan's Singer's Starting Guide was I have put together a new bundle. So as you know, I've got the pro bundle, the where you you get everything, right? You get the singer starting guide, you get the vocal warm-ups, you get the the three courses, one, two, and three. And that's all put into one big massive bundle called Dr. Dan's Pro Bundle. You get everything. But I've also created another bundle called the Beginner Singer Bundle. Yeah, it kind of got a bit of a ring to it. And that just puts together Dr. Dan Singer's starting guide, which includes those vocal warm-ups um, and cool-downs, and Voice Essentials One online singing course. And so we bundle those two together. And because the Dr. Dan Singer's starting guide is, is absolutely the best place for you to start your learn to begin journey. And so um, I hope you'll be able to take advantage of that um, uh, in the coming weeks and months. And I hope you'll be able to take advantage of um, your Q&A and, and all of that um, over the next, I don't know, how long we got, 40 minutes? Um, so let's dive into it because I want to answer some of your questions today. Okay, okay. So we've already, uh, we've already got a whole heap of questions um, in the live chat, and I can see you're keeping Linda busy. So for those of you who have not done this before, and I can see there's quite a few new names um, in the in the live chat. Um, Linda grabs your questions. So um, to participate in the live chat, you do have to be a subscriber to the channel. Um, which is easy enough to do, or you got to hit the subscribe button. It'll give you, it, it kind of, you have to wait a little bit for your opportunity to then participate in the live chat. You ask your question, and Linda puts it into a Word document that I can see over here on another screen, and, and we answer them chronologically as they come through. Um, but if you are absolutely desperate to make sure your question gets answered, then the way to do that is to put in a super chat. You just add a few dollars um, to your question and we prioritize your, your super chat 
question all of the proceeds all of the proceeds from the super chat go get invested back into the channel <laughs> because as i've said before the channel ain't a cheap thing to run so your support um is really appreciated but as i said we're just going to start off chronologically and uh and move through and we've already got Mackenzie, Kate, and and sometimes Mackenzie, because you've got a question every show, which I love. I love the fact that Mackenzie's got a question every show. But I am keen to answer your question first um, today, Mackenzie. Well, fortunately, it was the first question in the list, but because we've all known Mackenzie's been um, been preparing for some vocal surgery, and we've all been concerned to see Mackenzie, you know, work through that. Uh, and, and the good news, everyone, for those of you who have missed it in the live chat, Mackenzie's uh, surgery went so well that because they didn't find anything. So the thing that was observed um, during the video stroboscopy, um, and, I, and actually let me just double, yeah, so Mackenzie said that she had a video stroboscopy. That's where we have a, either a, a fixed camera that gets pointed into the mouth, and looks down on the vocal folds through the mouth, or a flexible nasoscope where it gets directed up through the nasal cavity and sort of sits down between the soft palate and the pharyngeal wall, looking down on the vocal folds. Um, when she had that, there was a lesion that was observed, or what the um, what the surgeon, the otolaryngologist, or just they might be a specialized um, a laryngologist ENT um, what they observed they thought they could see a lesion now a lesion might be um, a polyp it could be a granuloma um, there's a number of different uh, benign lesions that can develop on the vocal folds some of them we go into this in Dr. Dan Singer's starting guide like in a bit of depth so some of them are functional and some of them are organic. That is, some of them come about because of the way we've been using our voice or we've been caused to use our voice in a, in a for example, maybe we've been singing while we've been sick. Um, the others are what are referred to, so that's a functional, but there are others that are um, uh, organic or that develop a pathology that is, um, you, you kind of don't have any control over. So a uh, fluid retention cyst might be one of those. Um, what else? Uh, a paralysis or a paralysis of one vocal fold or bowing of the vocal folds. These are more organic developments. Um, and, uh, and, and often we get a combination of the two where it's both organic and functional and sometimes it's the chicken and the egg which came first and sometimes we don't know so when it comes to looking at that a surgeon will go about trying to identify before surgery it's almost an exploratory process and they might observe something that they see on the surface or within the structure of the vocal fold and and so that may in their um, expertise judgment determine a need for surgery and that was the case for Mackenzie and uh, and uh, so um, uh, I'm just reading this question again um, Mackenzie and so the reason why we can get into surgery um, and and not find what we expected to find is because sometimes the equipment um, may not might not be defective or not you know operate correctly but you've you've got to remember this is a a very small area that we you know are watching a very active space with the vocal folds and so sometimes it's almost like the voice can send off red herrings and and what we thought we saw um, may not be what is ultimately found and in this case the great thing was Mackenzie that nothing was found and I think that's terrific um, I do know that you had a, a pretty sore throat after surgery and uh, I hope that's calmed down for you I think in the Facebook group for those of you who are not a part of the Facebook group check out us on uh, Facebook 
uh, just search Dr. Um, the Voice Essentials Community Facebook group, and um, as long as you subscribe to the the um, the group rules, then you'll you'll be able to um, join us. Um, and uh, in that group, I was telling Mackenzie that we would expect it can take up to a week, sometimes even a little bit longer, for um, that sore throat to settle down. And that, that sore throat post-surgery is more often than not associated with the intubation process um, because sometimes that doesn't go as easily as the anesthesiologist would want. For example, I had a, a little, um, uh, little surgery last year um, and nothing, nothing to worry about. Um, and the, the, the worst part of that, act, um, that surgery was my throat for days after was just so sore. Now, um, they had tried to use what's called an LMA. The anesthesiologist had tried to use an LMA, what's a laryngeal, ma laryngeal mask airway. Anyway, it's called LMA. And it cups... The top of the vocal, uh, the the vocal, tr the the top of the larynx, the entrance of, but she had trouble, and I asked the surgeon afterwards. I said, "Why is my, what happened?" I told the the, I told the anesthesiologist that please be careful. I'm a professional singer, professional voice user. I really need my voice, you know. And I even asked her, you know, how was she expecting to intubate me? And she said she was going to be using an LMA, and I thought, oh, that's good. Incidentally, I've got a whole video on this very subject, intubation and and singing. You might want to check it out if you've got something coming up surgery-wise. It turns out it took her three goes um, to get the LMA to sit right um, and to you know to form the right seal across my uh, the top of my trachea. But in the process of pulling it in and out and trying different sizes. <laughs> She beat me up something bad, but it only about a week. It was around about a week and a half. The whole thing settled down, and um, and it it came good. So Mackenzie, I hope that is the case for you also. Um, the second part of your question, Mackenzie, was um, what should you expect from voice therapy? Um, well. <laughs> Voice therapy in this particular instance for you, um, Mackenzie, is uh, hard to identify exactly what you should expect simply because um, it depends on which angle the speech pathologist wants to take with you. Uh, when I send a singer to a speech pathologist, um, uh, it's generally because I'm wanting them to do some preventative work around the way they're using their speech, their voice for speech. And so we're, we're really working around for exactly the same things that I do with the singer with their singing voice. It's all the one mechanism, but it's doing different things. So you've got, you use your legs to walk. You also use your legs to run, right? same two pieces of pegs underneath your thorax but it's doing different things um, and uh, same thing with your voice so your speaking is a bit like you're walking and your singing is a bit like you're running so I'm a running coach and a speech is going to mostly work on your walking and so getting but because we just like we walk pretty much everywhere I don't it's, it's an unusual thing to, for people to spend most of their time running everywhere. Most of us are just walking most of the time. And the same thing with our, with our speaking. We mostly speak with our larynx as opposed to using it for singing. And that's even the case for professional singers. And so getting that speaking activity working really well is super important. Um, and so uh, I don't want to preempt what your speech, well, I'm not a speechy, but um, I don't want to preempt what they will or won't do with you, um, Mackenzie, but I do know they are going to want to really direct your attention 
to the way you are using your voice to ensure that it's efficient and that you're getting the absolute most out of it. And Mackenzie, and I know this is your attitude already, you you know, you know want to go into the process as, as teachable and as pliable as possible because as someone who wants to spend a lot of time doing a lot of singing, I know you will get a lot of value out of improving your spoken activities. So I hope that's helpful. Nicole Marie has asked, let me bring this up here a little bit. Oh, I hope that didn't jump out at you all. Uh, Nicole Marie has asked, my question is, have you heard of the still vocal method? Yes, Nicole Marie, I have. Um, and is it a good method to learn to sing? Also, is thyroid tilting from the still method a safe technique for singing? So the still method um, was developed by a, a, a vocal pedagogue I really did a lot of her big work back in the 70s and 80s and she developed what was what's called the um, Joe Estill method or um, the um, the Estill method. In fact, I think it's called, they call it something else, the association. Joe passed away um, a number of years back now um, and uh, but she was a highly respected, um, highly valued member of the voice teaching, voice science, voice research uh, group in the world, internationally. I had the great pleasure of singing for Joe and also presenting um, at a conference in front of Joe back in 2002, 20 years ago, and uh, at, at a conference in Adelaide, Australia. And uh, anyway, so she, she developed what, re, what she refers to as her figures. And they're essentially, it's a very ingredient-based, recipe-based approach to singing. And she first and foremost developed it for uh, classical singers. Uh, and, and, and others have come along and furthered her work into the world of contemporary vocal, etc. Now, I use some of those ideas and values that Joe is still, uh, uh, you know, gave us. Twang, the word twang, and you'll hear me use the word twang throughout all of my teaching, <laughs> teaching uh, materials. Uh, twang is a Joe is still, I mean, obviously Joe didn't, you know, invent the word twang, but she took that word and applied it in a very specific way to the to naming a very particular type of resonance, um, and and so that's she's she's contributed a lot to this area of of uh, of voice. Um, and so the question you've asked is oh, oh, around thyroid tilting, and so that's the idea where the the thyroid cartilage will will move forward um, on the larynx. Uh, sorry, on top of the cricoid cartilage, the whole thing's the larynx. And, um, and so the, the, the question you're asking, is it a safe technique? Uh, yes, it is safe. Uh, and, but it is important that you uh, understand that it has limits. There is no single methodology on the face of the planet that will give you everything, yeah? Uh, because, you know, there's no single method or methodologist can do that. Um, and so certainly take from the still method what you think really applies well to your voice and don't feel the pressure that it needs to be holus bolus, that you know, that you need to, um, that everything, you know, needs to apply to your voice, you know, like hand in glove. It, it often doesn't work like that, but, you know, ones like the Estill method, you will find there is more that you can take on board very safely than, than you know, stuff in it that you can't. And so that's how I'd, uh, I'd encourage you to approach it. So, 
I hope that's I hope that's helpful, Nicole Marie. LZ Cool, regards from Mexico, regards from Australia. Uh, LZ Cool, um, thanks for your time on this. Beginner here, I'm, we love having beginner singers as a part of our community. When I start singing, I have, ha have a hard time entering in the right note. Then as the song starts, I, uh, I tune myself through my ear. Any tips to start the song in the correct note every time? You know, it's, that's, a, that's a very normal um, process of learning for a beginner singer to go through LZ Cool. And uh, my encouragement to you is it's a matter of developing, um, spending more time with your voice, doing this voice thing. Um, and we develop our sense of accuracy through a number of things. We, we develop through our hearing in so much as that we're able to accurately identify the note that we're going to sing. And then in doing so, we're able to then coordinate the way the larynx, you know, correctly starts the oscillation of the vocal folds at just the right frequency and activates the the onset of the right note in the right way lz cool you're going to want to check out my new new video this week so in a couple of days time it'll go live wednesday midnight here in australia um and it's for absolute beginners and i even talk about the you know the way we onset the note and often in my material we'll we'll use a yeah yeah so we the the yeah helps to onset what's sometimes referred to as simultaneous or balanced onset and that kicks the note off really cleanly uh, and so you might want to check that out um, and so the way we develop and refine that sense of um, uh, accurate commencement of the note it takes time for many people it just takes time and regular consistent practice you can get apps and i've got um i've got a, a a video about two apps that help you to visually see your note and and so you can even practice some do some target practice with those um, but you know these things the the one thing i think a lot of people don't like to hear me say is these things take time and you do have to be patient and time and time and time again, excuse the pun, th those students who are willing to be patient and work through the process, you know, um, and allow the process of something like the Voice Essentials Learning Pathway, which has been proven time and time again uh, over thousands of singers now, so my learning pathway produces the results for those students who are willing to actively, patiently, determined, determinedly, is that even a word? <laughs> Work through the process. And uh, my, my journey, the, the one that I take students on, it's not a, it's not a fast process. Um, it, it's a slow and sure and steady and achievable learning pathway. And so you might want to look into that a little bit more, Esteban. Thomas, good to see you in the chat, Thomas. Are you a leggero tenor? Uh, I, this probably proves... You know, I say time and time again, you know, try to try to steer clear of... Firstly, try to steer clear of becoming too, you know, obsessed with voice types. Um, you know, and it also, what I'm about to say also proves that, you know, I'm not a classical singing uh, singer or singing teacher. I'm contemporary and rock, pop, country, indie folk. Um, I only describe myself as tenor. Um, because I have looked up what I would roughly be, you know, some people would refer to me as counter tenor. Um, 
it may well be that I'm, I, I, I have looked it up in the past, but because I don't keep it front and center of my thinking, I just, I can't remember. I forget how many, how many there are in the, in the German Fach system of, of voice types, there are 29 classifications across, you know, the highest female right down to the lowest male. <laughs> there are 29 different classifications and and Tanner, I think, from memory, has it has the most of within that twenty nine. I can't remember what I am, um, Thomas. You know, I don't know if that speaks poorly to me as a pedagogue, but I just don't get that hung up on it. Um, I can sing high, and you know, that's you know what I do know is I'm not a baritone, and and I've said this before. I would love to have those baritone, rich, chocolatey notes, but I don't. Okay, Josh for Kang. Uh, how long does it take to develop mixed voice? How long is a piece of string, Josh for Kang? Um, I it it what what you have to do mix voice. Firstly, mix voice is not a registration. Let's just get that clear. It is certainly the manner in which you, how you choose to balance the musculature and the acoustic value that that musculature is is creating. Um, and so, actually, it's the question underneath the label of mix is how long does it take to learn to coordinate your voice? That's the bigger question, and that's hard. It, the, the answer is it takes a long time and you know uh, it, it just takes it takes time I, I know I know I know I know online you will see time and time again you know it's almost like these online singing teachers you know um, tell, tell you they've got a magic wand and do you know step one two and three and you'll be you know, singing like Beyonce, it, 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 for the vast majority, and most of us are, are not the exception to the rule. Most of us are the rule. I'm the rule. You're almost certainly the rule. For most of us, it takes time to teach the body to coordinate in a healthy, sustainable, efficient manner. That's that's the they're, they're the three kickers: healthy, sustainable, efficient. If you, you we can trick your voice into doing a whole heap of different things, but more often than not, when we do that, when we take the shortcuts, we are undercutting health or the sustainability. You know, the ability to to repeatedly do this again and again and again, particularly if we then place that into a performance setting and efficiently, you know, getting the voice to do things, we might be able to get it to do things really quickly, but it may not be the most efficient way. And so to, to achieve those, the triad of vocal prowess takes time. You know, and um, and it's 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 an incredibly rewarding process to go through. the The level of self satisfaction that you will gain, and I see it. There are so many people right now in the live chat that I'm looking at, looking down. You know, and and Linda will tell you this. Kelly will tell you this. Karen Singwise will tell you this. You know, so many people can tell you how satisfying, like deeply satisfying, the the journey of vocal development can be, and uh, and so yeah, I, I encourage you to take that first step, step out, be. I don't even know. How, oh, we got into that via talking about mixed voice. <laughs> Oh, I got a little distracted. I got a little bit passionate there for a moment. Okay, Sai so, um, so Kieran. Uh, my vocal tissue is very weak. 
I can hardly speak. Any suggestions, sir? My vocals are not contracting continuously. Instead, they are in to and fro motion. Ian Doctor said I need to strengthen my vocals. Um, a male who is 22 years old. I, there, there, so there, there could be a, a number of things going on here. We would have to, I would want to see the report from the ENT to actually um, speak to that directly. Um, and it may well be, we talked about speech pathology earlier in today's, um, today's video. Um, it may well be that speech pathology, in fact, I almost certainly would think speech pathology is your first step um, in the development or rehabilitation of your voice. Um, but you, the way you're using words like vocal tissue is weak and things like the, um, there's a contracting continuously, they're not contracting continuously, the vocal folds. There's a number of different things that could be going on there. Again, you you want to find a good speech a, a voice voice specialized speech pathologist and you're going to want to take the ENT report along to that um, first session with them um, because it'll be then after you've spent time with a speech pathologist and they're getting your speaking values working and helping you to strengthen your vocal action your vocal fold response and uh, phonatory patterns. Once that's in place for your walking, then we take that and apply it to running and then you might find yourself working with someone like myself. Uh, Silas, uh, Silas Zeferino. Uh, Hi Dan, love your videos. Could you talk a little bit about types of support and strain? Uh, firstly, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Um, I was telling someone the other day, I think one of the reasons why I do so many videos is because I actually really enjoy the medium. I love using video to to teach and, uh, and so I'm glad you're getting something out of that. Um, could you talk a little bit about types of support and strain? So it's a funny thing, you know, the word support... Uh, and it's it's not you're not wrong to use the word support, Silas. But I, I, I don't know. I I I avoid using the term in my teaching. I think the reason for that is because when I think support, I immediately think of tension. I immediately think of constricted structure that creates, you know. Uh, too much air pressure. So more often than not, the word support will be um, used um, in keeping with breath support, you know. And breath, the, the term breath support, for me at least, conjures up this sense of really driving and creating this, what's referred to as sub, increased subglottal pressure that causes the larynx to grip and constrict and and so I, I tend to avoid the term support because that then, for me, tends to then go down the road of developing vocal strain because the larynx is under too much load and it has to work too hard. It is neither healthy, sustainable, or efficient. And so we have to uh, think about reducing that sense of strain. And, and more often than not, for contemporary singing, one of the big factors in reducing strain is in the reduction of air pressure, not the reduction of air flow. We're looking to maintain consistent flow while we have a, a relatively reduced air pressure. Um, and that's something that we have to work really hard on. Um, and it takes, again, that takes a long time. The coordination of these things just doesn't develop overnight for most people. Um, and uh, and so, um, Silas, I'd encourage you, I've got a whole video, quite a, a lengthy one, about breath management. And, uh, and I'd really encourage you to have a watch of that. 
Um, and if you've got time, also check out my courses because I, I, I go into all of this in, in quite a bit of detail uh, and, uh, and I know you'll, you'll get something out of it. Uh, wildflower, I love the way you've spelt wild, wild, so W-Y-L-L-D, flower, that's, that's cool. I'd like to, I'd like to know if specific, uh, specific sounds, vocal exercises strengthen specific muscles of the larynx. Yes, in fact, good vocal exercises will zero in on developing not all but you know for example if we're, if we're doing a twang exercise sing so using that joe estelle word twang sing now what we know about an ng which is what i'm doing that sound on is it's activating the muscle that sits around the edge of the epiglottis the epiglottis is the flap that sits above the larynx and will close the trachea off so that you can't get any um, food or fluid down into into your lungs when you swallow food or fluid. Um, but it, then it's, when I'm speaking now, it's just sitting up. Now in my voice, because I've got a bit of a bit of twang in my voice, it's also just shaping a little bit because there's a muscle that runs around the edge. Oh, it's hard to do with just a hand. A, a muscle called the eriepiglottic sphincter or eriepiglottic fold. These days we often just call it the twanger. And that, that muscle is activated and exercised when we do a NG. Sing. Now there are a number of other things that are going on when you create that NG, but I, in my you know, vocal teaching, use that to activate and exercise that very specific muscle. And so in good pedagogy, yes, there will be a range of activities where you are really, in one sense, isolating and exercising very specific musculature. And then we have other exercises which are designed to bring all of those activities together and help you coordinate them. So in one sense, some exercises pull it all apart and in, 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 in other exercises, they put it all back together because ultimately you've got to be able to coordinate and keep it all, you know, all, uh, you know, balanced and going well. So um, I hope that answers your question, Wildflower. Um, yeah, there are specific sounds, vocal exercises that strengthen specific muscles. We are going to give the last question to David Salmond. Is it good to warm up your voice one hour before you sing? <laughs> poor, poor Linda, I've caught her as she's literally still typing <laughs> the question. <laughs> I'm sorry, Linda. I can see the smile on your face as you're hurriedly trying to type this question in. This is going to be... Oh, before I do, um, Birdman has asked, can you sing for us? Birdman, we don't usually, you know... Um, I'm not usually singing here on the on the live. I do have, if you look in the description section of this video, you will find a link to me singing professionally, um, some uh, on for TV, some for live concerts. You can, there's a link down where you can watch Dr. Dan sing and uh, so you can go and check that out. So <laughs> I think Linda has finished typing. Uh, oh no, hang on. I think she is. Okay, she's written laugh out loud. LOL. Is it good to warm up your voice one hour before you sing? I cannot warm up any later as work in as you work in aged care. Uh, David, it certainly is good to warm up the voice. Um, it's it's funny, you know, vocal warm-ups. There are many battlegrounds in the world of teaching voice. And, uh, you know, the battlegrounds are around subjects like registration, breath management. And another battleground, believe it or not, is around vocal warm-ups. And, you know, these, the, the you know, the anti-warm-up group, um, 
you know, raise their, dare to raise their head, I don't know, every 10 years or so. I am not a part of the anti-warm-up group. I am a great believer simply because I, I have, I personally experienced the benefits and I see my students over the last 27 years of teaching also experience the benefits of doing vocal warm-ups. Now, something we go into in Dr. Dan Singer's starting guide is really understanding the difference between a vocal workout and a vocal warm-up. They are completely different things. A vocal workout can be a vocal warm-up, but a vocal warm-up is never a vocal workout. We go into that in the singer's starting guide. But the point being is a vocal warm-up should be done. They, they only need to be about 10 minutes, but they should be done whenever the voice is going to be placed under considerable load. And that can be because you're, gonna, you're about to do a, a, a big vocal workout, um, or it can be, so I'm, I'm, and I'm, when I say big vocal workout, it can be simply, you know, you're going to spend the next hour and a half practicing and learning a whole heap of new songs. Um, but it also um, it should certainly be implemented before you're about to do up a vocal performance um, because your voice is about to, you know, carry a lot of load and we can prepare that vo the voice for use. A good vocal warm-up is, is going to get the muscles moving. It's going to activate a, a higher level of blood flow. It's going to create malleability, a form malleability into the musculature and just get it moving freely so that um, those friction forces that will be brought to bear during load don't have such a negative impact on the voice over time while the voice is under load. So I hope that's helpful, um, David, because um, I very, very strongly recommend vocal warm-ups. And I've got vocal warm-ups that you can use for free on here um, on my channel. And so I encourage you to, to go and check those out. That is all we've got time for, everyone. I've got, I've got a private student who's about to arrive any moment. And, uh, and so I do need to get off to, to see them. Um, so good to be hanging out with you. I'm sorry it's going to be, as I said, you know, four or five weeks before we see each other again on the 9th of May. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe, hit the white bell icon. That way you'll get the notification every time we go live. And uh, something I, I do forget to do, you, you know, hit the, hit the thumbs up button. Encourage me. Let me know how much you enjoy the show. Um, and the thumbs up button is a good way for you to do that. Uh, until we see each other again, I do hope if you celebrate Easter, I do hope you have a blessed Easter. And, um, and uh, you know, even if you don't, um, I hope you, you remain safe and healthy over the coming weeks and months. We need, we, we need more safety and more health in the world, um, especially during this time. So I very much look forward to seeing you again soon. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.